Good morning. Good morning. Can everybody hear me? Sometimes this uh, sometimes this lapel mic works, and sometimes it doesn't. Um, we sure do appreciate the opportunity to come out uh, and do this demonstration for y'all. Um, you know, in previous years, we would come out, we'd go in the classroom, and uh, we'd do a, have a PowerPoint presentation. And, you know, over the last 30 years, I'm just like everybody else, I've fallen asleep in my share of PowerPoint presentations, and I know how old that can get. Um, and, you know, most people, whether it's linemen, firemen, uh, we're, we're mostly hands-on type people anyway. So we just figured that, you know, having a demonstration like this that you could actually see and participate in would be a lot better than being in a PowerPoint presentation and just doing the best you can to stay awake, okay? So uh, we're here this morning. We built this trailer. Um, it's been in service uh, for a couple of months. So not only is this a training session for y'all, it's a training session for us as well. And I can tell you that in the future, there's gonna be a lot bigger and better things that we're gonna do with this demonstration trailer. Some of those are just uh, being tested right now to make sure that we can do it safely, okay? Uh, with that, uh, the reason we're here this morning, number one is safety. Our safety, y'all's safety, and to make sure that at the end of the day that we all go home to the ones that we love and to the ones that love us. Bottom line, that's what this is all about. And there's no better group that knows that than this group right here. Uh, I want to tell y'all just a little bit about uh, how we're powering this thing. With most groups, we do not get into this much detail, but we're going to get into a lot of detail with y'all. We're going to cover some basic electricity. We're going to go over the different equipment. Um, and then we're going to uh, have a few demonstrations to uh, show y'all the potential that y'all face when you go out on the job. And uh, we hope everything works properly. Uh, but just keep in mind, like I said, this is a training session for us just as much as it is y'all. So we'll start, obviously, with the generator in the back of the truck. Um, something that we face many times uh, while we're working, and y'all as well, uh, whether it's an ice storm, whether it's a tornado, whether the power's out. Somebody just wants y'all to come out there because they've got some type of oxygen mask or some type of device that they need to run. Uh, we really want y'all to see what a generator will really do, okay? Uh, that generator, uh, for us, in this demonstration, is like a power plant. North Central buys all of its electricity from the Tennessee Valley Authority. Most people know it as TVA. That's the only people that we can buy power from. They generate that electricity in many different ways, whether it's a gas-fired plant, a coal-fired plant, a nuclear plant, a hydro plant. They do that generation in a lot of different ways, and they do it in the most economically feasible way for them. The cheaper they can generate it, the cheaper it is to us, the cheaper we can provide it to our members, okay? Now, that cord coming from the generator that plugs into the trailer and makes it work, for today's engine purposes, one, engine two, truck one, battalion one, stand by for, a call. For, for today's purposes, that's like a transmission line. So the really tall towers and the really tall poles that you see, that's transmission towers, okay? And that's what gets the power from the generating facility to our substations, okay? We don't generate anything. TVA generates all of that for us, okay? Now, this first transformer here, and I'm gonna let, uh, Robert, if you don't mind getting that switch stick, I want you to point to some of these things. Okay, this, this first pole right here, you'll see this transformer. Uh, this is an overhead pole-mounted transformer. Um, and we're gonna use this, this is gonna be like our substation. So the transmission lines, uh, they come from the power plant. Uh, it connects to our substations. And we step that electricity down from 161,000 volts to 14,400 volts, okay? And a question that we get a lot of the times is why does the voltage have to be so high? 
Well, with this group, it is very easy to explain. And the way that they teach this in basic electricity classes and advanced electricity classes is just like you got a hose hooked to that pumper truck. And you're trying to get water 500 or 1,000 feet down the road. If you start out with a drip at the pumper truck, you're probably not going to get anything coming out of the other end. Electricity is the same exact way. If it started out at 500 volts at the substation and the substation or the generating facility is 250 miles away, we'll never see any of that electricity by the time it gets here. So they have to pump that electricity out, TVA does at about 65,000 volts. And then it goes from the generating facility into a step up transformer that increases it to 161,000 volts or 500,000 volts. When we receive it, it is at 161,000 volts, okay? But that's the reason why the voltage has to be so high. When it leaves our substation, the same principle applies. The reason why it has to be 14,000 volts phase to ground or 25,000 volts phase to phase is so that by the time it gets to your house at the end of the line, it can produce a usable voltage so it'll operate everything in your house, okay? So that is the reason why the voltage has to be so high. All right, so above that transformer are switches. Now, we call these switches, we call them disconnects. They're actually, the, the proper name is a 100 amp line switch. That's what they're actually, 100 amp disconnect, okay? So when we, when we refer uh, to switches, that's what we're talking about. I'm going to ask Robert if he'll pick up that solid blade barrel off the trailer. In the switch, there's a fusible link. Now that, this one here is a solid blade, but the rest of them have a fuse element in it. That switch right there, that cutout, is the same thing as a breaker in a breaker box. It's just at a lot larger scale. Okay, and just like the breaker in your breaker box, it protects against over, overloading, arc protection, fire, all of those things. That's what it does. The switch on these transformers and on these lines do exactly the same thing. Okay, now when one of these switches blow, it makes a loud noise. And it's designed to do that. That way when your power goes out and you hear the loud boom, that lets you know that it's probably an issue with the power company. That way you can call us or you can call 911. Our members can and we can get out there and see what's going on. Now the lines, the power lines on the top and the bottom, on the transmission side, those are transmission lines. Once those lines leave our substation, they're called distribution lines. We are a distribution company. We take that electricity from TVA and then we distribute that electricity to all the members and homes and businesses uh, in our service territory, of which we have right now, North Central has a little over 31,000 members, which we just added last year 500 members. So housing permits and stuff in this area, this was a, a statistic that was a little surprising to me, are at the same rate now as they were before the recession. So things are booming again. And, and I'm sure that y'all are seeing that in y'all's workload as well, we certainly are. Uh, so those are called distribution lines. And when we get to the second transformer, the way that we have this one hooked up is we have a, an overhead service going to one of the houses, and I'll let Robert point to that overhead service. And you see that on a lot of older homes uh, where the service comes in overhead. And then there's also one hooked up, the one on the left is an underground service. And it comes from an overhead transformer, and it goes down a duct into the ground and comes up to the meter, okay? So that's the two ways that residential uh, customers uh, are hooked up. And then we come a little further down the line here and we have this, uh, what is referred to as the big green box. Uh, this is a transformer as well. Now the green box does exactly 
the same thing as the pole mounted transformers do. It's just that obviously uh, the pad mount transformer sets on the ground, okay? Now, one of the things that happens a lot is you'll see kids playing around these things and setting on them. Uh, when we were at the ballparks, I don't know why they do this, but behind the concession stand or behind the backdrop is always a big green box. And that's where the kids like to congregate and play. And uh, we just need to make sure that if we see that as best as we can, we need to get them to understand that there's 14,400 volts in that box. And you'll see the energy here that that can produce in just a few minutes. Uh, and this is just a step down small version of it. Uh, the full potential of that transformer is amazing. But electricity is just like fire. It's just like a gun. It's just like a car. It's just like anything else. As long as you play by the rules, as long as you follow proper procedures, everything is fine. But when you start doing things that are not the proper procedures, and when you start doing things that are not right and you're not respecting it, that's when bad things happen. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here. Y'all see the results of that probably every single day. Um, so with that, uh, what I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about a transformer uh, and how it uh, steps up or steps down electricity. Inside, inside that gray transformer or inside this green one, there's two coils. Now, a coil is made by taking a piece of iron, a lot of time it's tungsten, and they wrap that iron core with a lot of turns of copper. And what determines the voltage of a transformer is how many turns of copper is on one coil versus how many turns of copper is on the other coil, okay? So inside that transformer, you have what they call a primary coil and a secondary coil. I'm gonna get Robert to show you the primary or the high side of that transformer. That is connected to the primary coil inside the transformer. I'm gonna get him to show you the secondary side of that coil. That is connected to the secondary side of the coil in that transformer. Now, there's no magic about a transformer. You've got two coils sitting in that transformer submerged in oil, okay? That oil does two things. It keeps it cool. It keeps the coils cool when they start heating up, and it also insulates them from one another, okay? Now, the way that a transformer works is it will go either way. It doesn't matter. If you apply electricity to the primary coil, it's going to energize that coil. Now the primary coil and the secondary coil are not physically connected. There's no wire that goes between them. There's no magic that happens there. When you energize the primary coil, what does it produce? A magnetic field. And have y'all ever done the science project where you take the steel shavings and you put on a piece of paper and you put a magnet on one end and a magnet on the other with opposing fields and you, the closer you get to get them, get them together, they make the lines with the steel shavings. That is what uh, the flux lines of that coil look like once it's being magnetized. And all it's doing is this coil, the magnetism of this coil is energizing the secondary coil and that's called induction. So that's how the electricity is going from one coil to the other is through induction, okay? And uh, there's a lot of uh, fancy transformers out there that do a lot of other stuff, but basically they all work the same way, okay? Now inside those transformers uh, is oil, and that oil cools the transformer and it isolates or insulates the coils from one another, uh, but any transformer that you see prior to 1980, if it was manufactured prior to 1980, there's a chance that it could have PCBs in the oil. And that's something that y'all should be concerned about. It's something that we should be concerned about because P PCBs have been shown to cause cancer, okay? 
So when y'all show up out on the scene and the cars hit a pole and the transformer's leaking a bunch of oil, you don't know whether that transformer was made before 1980 or after 1980. So just keep that in your plan. When you show up on the scene and you're surveying everything, just keep that in mind that if there's oil everywhere and you get that on your shoes, your turnout gear, or on your clothes, then you're gonna take it back to the station with you or you're gonna take it home with you and then you're gonna throw those clothes in the same laundry that you do with your, with your family, okay? So that's why as best as you can, if you see a bunch of oil on the ground, uh, you need to avoid that if you can, okay? Most of the transformers after 1980 are labeled with a sticker like this right here that says non-PCB. Now a lot of the older ones, even if they were tagged, probably you wouldn't be able, the tag's faded or it's long gone and um, you really can't depend on that anyway because what they did uh, is they took a lot of transformers that were made before 1980, they took them down off the pole and they were going to put some fresh oil in there that wasn't PCB. So they take it down, they drain the old bad oil out, they put mineral oil in it. The problem was is they didn't boil the coil. So the oil that was in the coil just contaminated the brand new mineral oil that they just put in the transformer. So just because it has that non-PCB sticker on it, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that it's non-PCB. Uh, there was a school um, here locally that changed out a very, very large transformer and had a big sticker on it this big, said non-PCB. So naturally, uh, the contractor that changed that transformer out was interested in selling that transformer. Well, come to find out, they went through all of the uh, state safety steps that they have to in order to sell something like that. And when they tested that oil, that oil was hot as a firecracker for PCB, it was contaminated. And what happened is that transformer went to a rebuild shop. That rebuild shop just drained the old oil out, pumped new oil in it, and didn't boil the core, the coil. So all of that contaminated oil that was in the coil just got into the fresh oil and recontaminated it, so it really didn't help anything. So transformer oil is one thing that you certainly have to, you know, watch as well. Uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to start uh, our demonstration and uh, we'll stop along the way and we'll do a, a little bit more explaining. Uh, if y'all have any questions along the way, this is very informal. Y'all just stop me at any time and we'll answer any question that we can. So at this time, remember, the transformer is producing 240 volts and it's going through a breaker box on our on our demonstration trailer and then you see where it's plugged into this first transformer here. We're going to show you how 240 volts from a regular household generator, if it's stepped up, what the potential is. So uh, Robert, if you don't mind, let's go ahead and put the solid blade uh, barrel in the high side of the transformer. All the grounds are removed. Uh, all the ladders and stuff are out of the way. and you can close it when you're ready. Now, just like with y'all, y'all can see that their clothing is specialized clothing from their head to their toe. They've got on a hard hat that's rated at 30,000 volts. They have on safety glasses. They have on hearing protection. Their shirt is not just fire resistant. Uh, back around 1996 or so when all this stuff uh, started happening and um, all these standards started changing. At first, they just required uh, flame-resistant clothing. Well, what we have to wear now is called art-resistant clothing, okay? And there's calculations that we have to follow that says depending on what the guys are working on, here's the exposure. And depending on what that exposure is, this is the amount of layers of clothes or the type of clothing that they have to have while they're doing that work. So their shirts are special, their blue jeans are, the boots they're wearing are EH rated boots. The boots that we wear, there's nothing in that boot conductive, okay? 
That also helps to protect you about something we'll talk about later called step potential. And I know we've talked about that before, but EH rated boots will definitely help you with that. They have on rubber gloves. We test these every six months. We will soon be testing them every three months because it's just that important. Uh, and they're rated at 30,000 volts. The uh, insulated sticks that they're using, those sticks are tested. They're required by law to be tested every six months. They are tested by a wet test, 100,000 volts per foot, okay? So they have to withstand that type of test with water on them uh, in order for us to use them. If anything tests bad, we get rid of it. We don't try to recondition it. We don't try to rebuild it. We get rid of it because it's just too important. You'll notice the orange blankets on the ground Again, that is to help protect us from step potential, okay? And we'll talk about that here in just a few minutes. So we got the first switch closed. Remember, there's 240 volts coming from the generator, and I'm gonna ask Cliff if he'll take that tester and turn it on and put it at the top of that switch. Can everybody see that tester? It's registering 7.1. So that transformer is taking 240 volts and it's going through that transformer through the secondary coil first. The primary coil is increasing that voltage to almost 7,000 volts. Almost 7,000 volts. Now, how much electricity does it take to stop your heart? 20 milliamps. So that is the potential of a generator. If somebody hooks a generator up to their house improperly and you get out there, that breaker box doesn't do a bit of good. It's just energized that entire house. Okay? And we will show you in a minute all these myths out here about grounding out a transformer, don't you believe that? Because we're gonna short that transformer out and you're gonna see how it still keeps going. The only way that generator stops putting out power is if it eventually burns those brushes up so it can't make contact anymore. And how long does that take? Electricity travels at the speed of light. You, you know, you don't stand a chance, okay? All right, so at this point, uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Cliff, if uh, they'll set up on the ladder, and we're going to do the first demonstration here. Now, when we're talking uh, to, to everyone else other than uh, firemen, obviously, when we talk about aluminum ladders, uh, we're talking about how they need to be careful when they're doing home improvement projects and stuff like that. Uh, and we talk about the difference between a conductor and an insulator. A conductor allows for the free flow of electrons or electricity. An insulator does not. An aluminum ladder is obviously a conductor. So with this group, it's not so much uh, the homeowner aspect of it that we're worried about, but we know that y'all have a lot of ladders and you do a lot of things with different types of ladders. So Cliff's going to show you if you get an aluminum ladder too close to a utility line, what can happen. All right, Cliff, whenever you're ready. Okay, now y'all can go ahead and secure the ladder. Let's talk about that arc for a minute. An electrical arc like that can reach degrees of 35,000 degrees in the blink of an eye, less than the blink of an eye. 35,000 degrees is five times hotter than the surface of the sun. That's why we don't like to hear that sound 
And we don't like to see that art. Because when that happens, that means somebody's work plan didn't go well, okay? So if you're out on a job, whether you, you're using a big, tall, 90, 100-foot ladder truck, or whether you have uh, something aluminum in your hand, anything conductive, when you get around a utility line, you need to remember that that is what the potential is, okay? If you get, it, if you get exposed to an arc like that, there's no clothing, there's nothing that's going to protect you. And in less time than it takes to blink your eye, it's not just going to burn your flesh, it's going to burn your bone. And most people that, that get exposed to an arc like that or a contact, as y'all know, they don't die from the contact. They die from the infection that they get while they're in the hospital from the injury, okay? Okay, this next demonstration we're going to show y'all goes along the same principle. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Robert if you'll take a switch stick and let's take a regular barrel and close this line switch in. Line switch. Okay, now what Robert did there is he closed that switch in at first between the, the first pole and the second pole, that line was energized, the rest of it wasn't. When he closed that line switch in, it just made the entire uh, demonstration trailer energized, okay? All right, eons ago, uh, when I was a teenager, um, everybody, every house had a big antenna on it. And it was almost like a competition with dads as to who could have the tallest antenna in the neighborhood. And I spent half of my childhood out there on Saturday mornings turning that antenna, trying to get better reception so dad could watch wrestling, okay? Well, with satellite TV and, and, and cable TV and stuff like that, we don't see as many TV antennas as we used to. But now, all of the things that replaced the old TV system we have are getting really expensive. Satellite TV, cable TV, all that stuff is getting really expensive. So people are looking for alternative solutions to offset that cost. And they're starting to buy HD antennas. And obviously, uh, y'all know about HD signal. If you have an HD antenna and a local station's broadcasting in HD, you can pick that up. You don't have to pay for it. Well, now the issue's starting to come back up because people are trying to get those HD antennas in a place where they get the best reception. So Cliff is going to show you what happens uh, when you get an antenna uh, on a pole that's conductive too close to an energized utility line. And we get calls like this all the time. People will install these antennas and we'll drive by and it'll be this far from the utility line, you know. And all they had to do was bump it, and it's over. I mean, very few times do you get a second chance. And everything that we're talking about has happened. So, all right, Cliff. All right. So that just shows um, you know, what can happen. Um, I, was on a, I was on a fire scene one night and we got called out uh, to kill the electricity because a car had just hit a pole. And the ladder truck was setting a couple of poles down from where the car was at. So we pull up on the scene and what the firemen didn't realize is when they had, the car had hit the first pole, it had actually damaged the next two. So the circuit was energized, firemen were sitting in the trucks waiting for us to do what we needed to do, and the pole that was beside their truck fell over. And those energized lines hit the top of that ladder truck. 
and it cut through that aluminum ladder just like a lifesaver in Star Wars would. Every electrical thing in that truck started popping and burning, and it completely destroyed that truck. So on top of all the other things that y'all have to watch out for, when you initially pull up on that scene, it's very important to do a survey of that whole area. And I know that's tough sometimes. We get caught up in the same thing. We get caught up on a scene where a car's hit a pole, and when we pull up, our, our initial intention is right there where that car's hit that pole. But what are the dangers 100 or 200 feet away from where the accident scene really is, okay? So that's just one example of, of what utility lines can do. And again, uh, there's no scare in this group, and I understand that. Y'all see a lot of stuff on a daily basis that even people like myself just don't see. And it's not meant to scare anybody, especially this group. It's just meant to get y'all to respect what can happen and just try to plan for those things as you encounter them, okay? Um, now, a lot of times y'all get calls and there'll be balloons on power lines and, and people sometimes they don't know that, that they, uh, they should call us. It seems like the fire department gets called for everything. And we talk about conductive materials and some of these balloons are absolutely conductive. Go ahead and suck it in something clear. A little more. So what I'm going to ask Cliff to do is on that switch for the transformer station, in just a second, I'm going to ask him to put it between that switch. Now, y'all watch the light bulbs on these two houses over here, and you're going to see how as something as uh, simple and innocent as a balloon, what dangers that it can actually pose as well. Go ahead and suck it up a little bit more so you got some control of it. Okay. All right, see if you can get it in there. Not behaving. There you go. See how electricity's flowing through the balloon? And that's just because of what the balloon is made out of. Alrighty. So when y'all get a call sometimes and a pole's on fire, or there's fire on the ground, that's how it started. Balloon got across an energized line, it got across a switch, it gets stuck there, it catches on fire. Obviously that drops to the ground, and now all of a sudden we have a grass fire, right? Okay, let's talk about the next thing. Now obviously, this time of year when we start getting storms, Y'all are gonna get a lot of calls because trees have gotten in power lines and stuff like that. Now the lights are not gonna glow as bright, but Cliff's gonna hold that across that switch and y'all watch the lights start to glow. There you go, just hold it on there. Okay, see they're not as bright. I don't know if you can see it glowing right there. But this is just to show a lot of people don't think that electricity will flow through a tree branch, but it will. And especially if it's wet, okay? See how the meter's on right there? See how the meter's flashing on? The only way that meter comes on is if electricity's flowing. So if y'all go out somewhere, okay Cliff, if you go out on a job or out on a, a, a scene and you see a tree limb that's on the utility line, if it's touching the utility line at the top of the branch, what's going on at the trunk? To some degree, electricity's flowing because electricity's very lazy and all it's doing is looking for the path of least resistance, okay? And when you're out there on the fire scene, I can tell you, you don't have to even think about this one, your body is the path of least resistance. It's least resistant to anything else out there on that job, okay? All right, with that, uh, I'd like to go ahead and let's open up the line switch. 
and take that barrel out. You can just set it there on the fender, Robert. Let's take that solid blade and put it on the low side of the transformer. Now, for safety reasons, what we're doing here is we're taking this switch off of the high side of the transformer and we're going to operate the next demonstration off the low side of the transformer. Because the next demonstration, if we did that off the high side of the transformer, you wouldn't be able to stand here right now. It's going to release that kind of energy, okay? All right. Put that in the uh, line switch. Right here. No, in that line switch right there. Now what we're fixing to do, we could do with the ladder, we could do with the antenna, but we want to do it in something that causes us a lot of problems and that's wildlife. Whether it's a bird, whether it's a squirrel, snakes, raccoons, anything you can think of, uh, when it comes to power lines, we have issues with it. Okay, Cliff, whenever you're ready. Now this is going, if it works properly, this should uh, make a little noise here. Now, that's 120 volts that we just crossed right there. Now I want you to put that in perspective if that had been 7,000 or like on our system if it had been 14,400. How many volts is in a meter socket? How many volts is in a meter socket? 240 volts. That was 120 volts. Okay. So now we're going to do a demonstration. This is the first time we've done this, so hopefully it'll work. Um, let me have that uh, little bird there. Let's go ahead and take a uh, regular barrel refuse the line switch and refuse and then we'll get ready to refuse this in just a second. We'll go ahead and refuse the line switch. Okay now take the uh, both the covers off of that meter socket right there. Now what we have here is a fused element. And this is just, we have this rigged up so we can hold on it with a hot stick and we have a little piece of a fuse element coming out of this end. And we're going to show you that if you get a meter socket crossed up, what the potential is, okay? One of the top lugs to anything grounded. Oh, I'm sorry, we got to energize the transformer first. That might help. Now what we have here, we only do this for first responders. We don't do this around school kids. We don't do this for other groups. Y'all are the only group that we do this for. <laughs> yeah, it's not working. There it goes. Had to get it to ground. Now, look at the side of that meter box. So, you stick an axe in there or a screwdriver or half the stuff that y'all have on that fire truck, that's what can happen. 
Y'all, that is 120 volts he just shorted out. That wasn't even 240. That was 120 volts he shorted out. And because, you know, how meters are made, some of the old meters have glass on the front of them, okay? So it really wouldn't even have to be that violent to break that glass. And uh, I don't know how much y'all talked about the NFPA 70 and arc in a box. I don't know how much y'all talked about that. But that situation right there, that arc, only has one direction to go, right? Which way is it? Right towards you. You see up here in open air, on these power lines, it's got all of the air for that energy to go. But that right there is called arc in the box. And if you go to unplug a meter, and there's a meter part that's broken in there that you don't know about, or maybe the heat got so hot it melted one of those wires, but that wires, did y'all see the transformer switch blow? That, that meter center blew up, that transformer's still hot as a firecracker. And in arc in a box on voltages that are low like that, most of the time it's not gonna blow the transformer switch. It's gonna sit there and it's gonna burn until it burns that wire in the clear, and when it's sitting there, it's still gonna be hot. So just imagine you're out there and you're standing in a puddle of water. Or just imagine if you pull the meter, the, the top of that meter socket is still hot. What about, if there's a, what about if it's a duplex and you don't know and there's another meter on there? What if the house has a sub panel? What if you go to a house that's been turned into a commercial uh, building for cutting hair or something like that and you don't know and you go over and you pull the meter and you think that just killed it and it didn't all that meter's doing is just measuring demand you haven't done anything and i know that when y'all show up on the fire scene fire scene a lot of times y'all are choosing between life and death and not just for yourself but for other people and i greatly appreciate what it takes to run into a situation where most people are running the opposite way. But I know that y'all are trained on this day in and day out. If, if the house is on fire and somebody's in trouble, what's the one thing that's gonna do to make that worse? If you go in there and you get in trouble, because then somebody's gotta go save two instead of one. Think about what happens, you only got one set of eyes, it's gonna take your job away from you. It's gonna take your standard of living away from you. So like I said, it's, it's, it's not meant to scare anybody, it's just to show you what the real potential is. And then I have full faith that, you know, that y'all will make the right decisions out there on the fire scene. But just remember that that's the potential. And uh, if you can, if you can wait till we get there, please allow us to get there. Now, we are making some advancements in our system that in the very near future is going to allow us to do some things to really help y'all out. We're going to have a, we're building out a full SCADA system and we will have a control room operator. So if y'all get out on a job and something is really bad going on, we'll have a number that you can call and a guy can punch a button on a computer screen and he can kill that whole circuit but we're not there yet, okay? But that's what we're building out. And you know, Olive Branch, that, that capability, will, capability will be here, you know, very soon. And as soon as it does, you know, then we'll do some additional training uh, because it's important for us. Uh, we, we, had a, uh, we had a meeting yesterday and our CEO made it clear that it's not just North Central's responsibility to keep employees safe. It's to keep first responders safe. It's to keep the general public safe. It's to keep people who are just driving through and stopping to get something to eat on their way to somewhere else. It's our responsibility to make sure that people can go to work and live in this community and be safe while they're doing it, okay? All right, let's go ahead and open this transformer back up.
and you take that barrel out. All right, and you can take the line switch out. All right, let's take the solid blade out. And then Cliff, after he takes that out, let's test the line. All the switches are open. See how that's still picking up? So until a line is grounded, you can never assume just because that switch is open. Guy comes out there and he runs a stick up in the air, he yanks the switch open, until it's grounded, you don't know for sure that it's completely dead, okay? That's why our guys need to get out there and make the scene safe for y'all, okay? And like I said, I know there are a lot of difficult decisions to be made there that I don't encounter and that I probably don't understand. But when it comes to unplugging meters for firemen and working around electricity, me trying to explain to y'all how to safely do that in an hour or a day or a week would be just like you telling me how to fight every fire you encounter in an hour or a day or a week. And we both know that's impossible. There are things on a fire scene that takes years to learn. And that's why experience is so important. It's the same way in what we do. When our guys go out on a the scene, they may see something about that meter socket or that meter base that y'all just have never seen before or that you don't understand. So let's not let this, that trip us up. Okay, all right, uh, let's go ahead and turn the breaker to the transformer on and then let's, let's test the line again. Yeah, let's go ahead and test it again. Cut the right breaker on. Okay. Let's turn the generator off, Cliff. Now, the whole time that we've been talking about this, and y'all seen us, what we did at the meter base, you seen us blow the line switch, what's still running? That generator. It's never let up. It's never even sputtered. It's still going. So if somebody tells you that a piece of wire or something like that can just simply ground out a generator, that's just not the truth, okay? Now, if you put a wire across there and you left it there, uh, turn the uh, battery back up off. If, uh, if you just left a wire there, eventually, if the piece of wire you put across it is big enough, would it eventually short the transformer out? It'd burn the brushes up. But how long does that take, you know? When we're dealing with stuff that happens in the blink of an eye, you know, that's just a chance we can't take. All right. Um, any questions about anything we've talked about so far? Because I'm going to switch gears on you. Okay. <clears throat> One of the biggest things that firemen face on the fire scene is step potential. <coughs> okay. If you get out on the scene and a car has hit a pole, or a tree has knocked a power line down, or anything like that, you don't know if that line is energized or de-energized. Because you can't see electricity, you can't smell it, and if everything's working properly, you can't hear it. So until somebody there with the proper test equipment shows up, you don't know whether the line is energized or not. 
So let's just imagine that one of the wires coming off of this uh, demonstration trailer is laying on the hood of that truck. That truck's sitting on six rubber tires. So what's going to happen more times than not, and I will never say always, because as y'all know, always doesn't apply to much, but most of the time it's going to energize that truck at full primary potential. Somebody's in the truck screaming for help. You go over there and you grab that door handle on that truck, what happens to you? You just became that fuse. You just became that breaker in that breaker panel in that house. You know, how long can you hold on to it and hope that a, a switch or a device blows or trips? That's going to happen in the blink of an eye. Sometimes because of step potential, you may not even make it to put your hand on the truck. You say, how does that happen? Imagine that you take a rock and you throw it into a pond. It makes that ripple effect. And you got those rings in that pond. Well, you just imagine rings around that entire truck. The further you get away from the truck, the less voltage is going to be on the ground. But let's say 20 feet away from that truck, the voltage is 500 volts. But let's say you take a step and 18 feet away from that truck is at 1,000 volts. That's called a difference of potential. One foot is in a ring that's at 1,000. One foot is in a ring that's 500. Where's that difference of potential going? right through your heart. It takes 20 milliamps, as y'all know better than I, to kill you. I tell people all the time, and this won't impress y'all, it takes five batteries in an AED to get your heart back right. And you're talking about 7,000 volts. In the summertime, most of the circuits running up and down this road running at two, 300 amps. To put that in perspective, if you took uh, one of our utility lines energized at 14.4 with 200 amps behind it, you can't ground that line out. You could grab it with a stick and you could put it to the ground, it'd burn forever. Until there's no more metal to burn, it'll keep burning. What protects you is our substation equipment and our switches that are out on the line. So if people try to talk to y'all about grounding the line out and stuff like that, do not believe that, okay? That's just how much power is there. So when you pull up on the fire scene and there's a car that's hit a pole, it's nighttime, you got lights going everywhere, sometimes your eyes play tricks on you. If you're not real careful, you'll walk right into a utility line with your head and you won't ever even know it. It happens a lot, y'all. It happens with our guys. You know, you go to a, a place where there's just been a hurricane come through or a tornado, earthquake, a lot of things, a lot of areas that y'all may be called to work in. You know, if there's power lines running everywhere, you know, that has to be dealt with first because y'all can't do your jobs properly if that's not taken care of first, okay? So make sure that you're looking around. If you see a power line on the ground, for goodness sake, stay away from it. You don't know how far out that step potential's going. Okay? And remember, if you show up, somebody's in a car, lines on the car, and they're telling you and they're screaming at the top of your lungs and you're trying your best to get them to stay in the vehicle, if, they just, if you just know that they're fixing to walk out of that vehicle, if you can, just get them to jump with their feet together as far away from that vehicle as you can and then keep their feet together and bunny hop away from that vehicle. Because if you do your feet like this, you never know where that line's at, okay? Any questions about step potential? All right, any questions about anything we've talked about this morning? Well, we're really gonna work uh, on some new demonstrations uh, the, the one that I hope to show y'all next time, we're actually going to energize a vehicle.
and we're going to take a tester on a real long stick and we're going to put it on that vehicle and show you how it's still energized. But just like y'all don't want to do things in the training field that can get you hurt, we don't either. We want to make sure that we can do that safely. Uh, but that's just something that we're working on for next time, okay? Guys, I really do appreciate it. Thank y'all very much. Uh, I hope that's been better than a PowerPoint presentation that, um, you know, we're all trying to stay awake for. And uh, if y'all ever got any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, you know, we'll come out and do this for schools, uh, any kind of, you know, civic group like that right there. If y'all know somebody that would like to see it, we'll be glad to do it. And uh, Dave knows how to get in touch with us. And I just appreciate uh, everything that y'all do for us. And I know that people don't tell y'all that enough, but believe me, uh, even in the crazy world that we live in today, there are people that appreciate greatly what y'all do for us. So with that, thank y'all, and uh, we'll see you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>